right, YouTubers, welcome. And uh, thank you for joining me. It's Joey Bougeau here. And um, for those of you who have been following my channel for a while, uh, I've taken a bit of a hiatus from doing regular content. And uh, just at the behest of some of the subscribers and some of my mentors, I'm kind of jumping back into the fray. And I'm very excited to have a special guest today to uh, be chatting with me on my channel. Um, I've been studying astrology with him since uh, March of 2019, and it's been a fantastic experience. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, his perspective on Jyotish, on Vedic astrology, and on the lineage that he comes from, because it's very, very interesting uh, story and background. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, his, his, uh, his course, which you know has been a transformational experience for me to uh, to say the least uh, ladies and gentlemen without further ado i love to welcome mr freedom cole freedom welcome thank you thank you I've, for the nice introduction i've uh, I, i've been excited to have you uh on my channel just to chat about a couple of things um, and I kind of want to jump right into it, if that's okay. Um, 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 sounds great to me. <laughs> okay, good. So you come from a long lineage, um, coming from Orissa, which is currently the uh, Param Guru is uh, Pandit Sanjay Rath. Yes. And um, this is from the uh, uh, Sri Achyuta Nanda Das uh, lineage. And I would just wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about the background of the lineage and your relationship with, uh, with Sanjay and how that came to pass? So, uh, you know, when we speak easily, we just say the Sri Achyutananda lineage. And it's, it's slightly more complex than that. And uh, for me, this is a great moment to kind of go a little bit more into that complexity. Uh, we have the spiritual lineage and then we have the family lineage. And uh, when we look at the family lineage, uh, Pandit Sanjay Roth, uh, his family, uh, they have a very long continuity of tracing back. And they, they have a long list of names that, you know, go, th like literally they, they keep go going back of, who, of, of names. And, and uh, they were invited to Arissa in the 1500s. But if we go back, they trace the origin of their family lineage to the Somanath temple in the Gujarat area. And I'm just going to reference uh, in the Ascendant magazine, I have a whole article on the Somanath temple and how, what a powerful place it is to represent Hinduism and, and in, in India. Uh, but the area around the Somanath temple, because Somanath means, Soma means moon, and it's, it's Prabha Kshetra, meaning the place of, and Prabha is this word for light that kind of means soft light. So it's like moonlight. And it's a very Jyotish oriented area. And we know that um, uh, 2000 years ago, there was so much Jyotish happening in that vicinity. And uh, there were invasions that started around the 800s. And uh, at that time, the family moved to the, to the university area of Madhya Pradesh. There were a lot of big universities in Madhya Pradesh at that time. And uh, so they first moved there and they were a very intelligent, intellectual, respected family. So they were invited to that area, they were teaching in the universities, and then um, with the various um, Islamic rulerships and destruction of, of universities and, and political changes, they were invited by the king of Orissa to come to Orissa and um, teach there and do Jyotish there in the 1500s. So the family made it to Orissa in the 1500s. So we have the family lineage that was carrying this Jyotish um, all this time. And uh, then when we got to Orissa, uh, India was, you know, there's always, a lot of times people think of religion as a static thing. And uh, religion is constantly changing. 
and uh, even Hinduism, there's various movements that arise and alter the direction and the focuses. Um, if we look at just Christianity, you know, if we talk about Jesus and what's actually being practiced now, there's a whole variation of movements of how it evolved till now. And, and Hinduism is very similar. Um, so the family we know in when they were in the more Gujarat area were a Shaiva based um, tradition and they carry the family deity of Somanath with them. There's a Somanath temple that his family built in Orissa because they each time they move they carried their form of Somanath with them. Now when we get to Orissa, Orissa at that time it was a place you could say that was taking the spiritual refugees from India. And a lot of various religious groups were, were running to Orissa because there was a lot of more jungly areas where they could set up ashrams and, and not be persecuted. And uh, they say it was the last real holdout of Buddhism in, in India at that time. And there was a very strong Vajrayana Buddhist presence in Orissa. And it was around the 1500s that uh, it was King uh, Pratapa Rudra. He started persecuting the Buddhists. And so the Buddhists all started um, becoming Vaishnavas at that time. And the Shaivas were also becoming Vaishnavas. It was, you know, a po political kind of situation more than a religious situation. Sure. And uh, because so many people were converting and the way it worked is the Hinduism that developed at that time period was a very inter it was an integration of Vaishnavism, Shaivism, Shaktism, and Buddhism, all working together. Who has what? Okay, we'll use this from here, this from there, and and uh, so um, the Utkal Vaishnavism, Utkal meaning Orissa, that Vaishnavism. It's a very rich and deep Vaishnavism. It's not, uh, it's, it's not simplistic as most people would think. And uh, Achyutananda was a major teacher during that time period. And so Achyutananda was, he was actually one of the uh, main people who was working on generating what Utkal Vaishnavism looks like. It, there was all these diverse elements and how do they work together? How can they be healthily used together? How is it not a mix mash, but a cohesive system, yet integrating these various um, elements of different systems? And so Achyutananda was um, uh, very powerful in, in what was created at that time. And he's also very famous because he, at that time period, there was also a desire to make the plethora of Sanskrit literature and knowledge available to everybody, not just Brahmanas. And so he had a huge translation project, translated thousands and thousands of texts from Sanskrit into Odia, the language of Orissa. And, um, so, uh, and so the um, Pandit Sanjay Rath's family and, and Achyutananda, you know, uh, they became associated with Achyutananda. And so the tradition merged at that time. Uh, and Achyutananda was known as a, a great astrologer himself. And uh, every, all of his teachings were integrated with, with Jyotish and um, how much went which way from um, Pandit Sanjay Rath's family and how much went for, you know, we don't know, but there was a mixing at that time. And so uh, that's the um, late 1500s, early 1600s. And so the lineage is, uh, there's a direct link from that time to the present. Wow. Um, and so, yes, it's a very rich tradition, very rich lineage. Um, both on the spiritual side as well as the Jyotish side. Well, that's fantastic. So, and so when we say, and, and uh, so when we say, you know, from the Achyutananda lineage, I just, you know, just to expand what exactly that means, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. So, 
So then currently, uh, Pandit Sanjay Rath, he's the, he's the uh, I guess he received the transmission from his grandfather, was it? Um, so, so yeah, to talk about, so Utkal Vaishnavism mm -hmm. is a very, uh, we could say it's almost very traditional. You know, as I said, there was refugees, there were so many different variations. And so there's multiple lineages and they're, held within families. So uh, Pandit Sanjay Rath, he's, he's holding his family lineage. He's authorized to teach from that lineage. He also has uncles and other relatives that hold that knowledge. Um, but, uh, you, you know, when he first started teaching, uh, he got a lot of criticism in Orissa, like how dare he teach this knowledge <laughs> to not only non-Indians, but non-Orissans, non-people that aren't from Orissa, that aren't Orissan Brahmins. How dare he teach this knowledge to them? And um, it was, uh, I, I was, you know, a student of him at that time. And it was, it was a big hardship to, to be in your, your place of birth and instead of getting respect for what you're doing, to really be um, a, a lot of criticism for sharing what he was sharing. Right, right. So he's, he's, there's more than him authorized to teach, but he's the only one from the lineage who's teaching to the, the wider world. Okay, okay, understood, understood. And so how did you uh, come into contact with, uh, with Pandit Sanjay Rath? I think, it, how long mm. ago was it roughly? Uh, I, I became a student in 2000. In 2000, okay. And uh, he had um, uh, one or two books published and he was writing some stuff online. And uh, I just looked in one of the books that had an address and I went and knocked on his door while I was in Delhi. And uh, at that time, I was doing a lot of work with Ayurveda in mm -hmm. India. And so I was already in India, and I just, it wasn't too much to stop by. Okay. And um, I just happened, the first time I came, it just happened to be a Sunday. And at that time, he was working for the government. Mm -hmm. And on Sunday, his students would come around noon, and he'd teach from noon till into the evening, sometimes seven, eight, nine at night. Um, and they were all pretty advanced students. And I had read everything available in English at that time, but was not ready for what was being taught. And I remember holding on to my chair and just almost being dizzy with the, the level <laughs> that was being taught. Right. And it was great because I was getting to this place where I was feeling like, okay, what's more to learn? And then I finally tapped into this place where I was a baby. There was so much to learn. And <laughs> but you nevertheless you you persisted and you um you basically stayed in India for, for a period of time, did you not? I, I would do half years there. I would do okay. so many months there and then come back, work, make a little money here, and then back to India. So. Okay. And then you managed to continue. And then uh, how long ago was it that uh, you, were, you, were author you were authorized as an Acharya of the tradition to uh, bring... So, uh, the, so the, term, the term used is guru of the tradition, okay. just for... Um, okay. Um, in, in, and it's an interesting, you know, uh, some places guru is held higher than acharya, but in the tradition, uh, acharya is held higher than guru. So guru is, you know, to be considered acharya means that anything I would say in the tradition is undisputed. Oh, wow. And I'm not given that authority. I'm only given authority to be a authorized teacher, which is Jyotish guru. Okay. And, um, uh, it was around 2004, five, um, uh, where so somewhere in that time, um, he, uh, I was given authorization, the mantras that are required for that. And, uh, and then it was a push to, you know, start taking students in the U S and I fought it a little bit and I still fight it. Um, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know, it's, it's, I've learned so much by teaching. So. Well, that's great. But you, you eventually uh, compiled the knowledge and uh, you know, in an effort to uh, make it a little bit more accessible to the layperson, you, you wrote the, uh, well, the two volumes of science of light. And I understand that perhaps in the, not too distant future, there may even be a third volume as well. Yes. And these books really are um, the essence of the foundational principles that are found within Brihat Parashar Horashastra, which is uh, regarded as the, the authoritative text of Jyotish. Of course, there's other texts as well. Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about those, uh, those volumes and uh, the intention behind those, because I think that sort of goes hand in hand with the course that mm -hmm. you've, you've, you've developed uh, over the years as well. Yes. Uh, so originally, uh, I just was teaching. And every weekend, there'd just be random topics, and I'd just be teaching. And that's, what, that's how it was done in India. And so that's what I was doing here. Right. And uh, I have two YouTube channels, one that's uh, um, places where I, I lecture or, you know, at conferences. And one of them is recordings that are from that time period. And uh, um, 2004, five and six uh, recordings. And so, you know, for those who want to look at that, they're, they're freely available on YouTube. But you can see that there are scattered topics all over the place because we would come on Sunday and whatever um, uh, Param Guru was in the mood for, that's what we would be listening to. Right. And it'd be a full moon, uh, and he would be like, ah, this is the day that I can teach the Sri Lagna. And we'd get the Sri Lagna calculations and dashas from it, and, and, and then next time we'd come, there'd be something happening, and, and the teaching, so the teachings were almost invoked by the stars themselves. Beautiful. Um, and so I, I taught like that for a while and people would come and stay for a while. People would go and, and uh, you know, I, I started getting the, and people would complain that they're not understanding concepts and they, and so there was this constant request for, can't you give an overview or a general introduction? <laughs> and so I started working with that and that slowly turned into the volume one. Okay. And, and volume one, two, and what will eventually be three, uh, uh, Pandit Sanjay Rath was requested to do the curriculum for a university Jyotish program. And he was working with it, working with it, trying to, um, and, and so I sat down with him and I said, so Guruji, what's the most important thing to learn about this? And he would say, and I'd write it down, and I'd just go, well, what's the most, if, if I learn that, what do I have to learn first before I learn this? And so I just kind of asked him questions and, and filled it out. And so, and, and then it gave a skeleton of, of the teachings. And he was like, perfect. And then he went and filled it out and deepened it. And uh, it's, it's uh, actually, then the, the university kind of did their own editing of it, which for whatever, you know, and, and now it's, it's actually being taught. But so I had that skeleton. So with that skeleton, I pick and chose from that to create that beginner course. And so that's where Signs of Light 1 and 2 came from. Right. But when we're talking about, yeah. um, like, let's say, the, 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 the beginner's course, Signs yes. of Light, vol, um, the, the, the first year, which the year that I complete, I would, yeah. I would interject and say that um, although it is accessible for newcomers, yes. there is a lot of content that needs to be learned because yes. you're not necessarily teaching um, your version of Jyotish. You're going back to, particularly to Parashra, um, primarily, and you're, you're showing the textual references and you're trying to build the student's relationship with the actual Shastric texts. And, and the thing is, that's how it was taught. That's how Pandit Sanjay Roth teaches. He never, uh, you know, in, in my training, there was nothing said that couldn't be referenced. 
And even, even if there's something said, we go back to the verse, this is where this is coming from. Here's the idea presented here. So-and-so interprets as th this, so-and-so interprets it like this. 15th century, so-and-so interpreted it like this. This is how our tradition interprets it. And uh, so we had, we, everything was based from the Sanskrit texts. And so that's how I was taught. And so with Science of Light Volume 1, I make sure that I'm going through the text and then I'm giving the tradition's interpretation of the text. Now, occasionally you get YouTube um, channels and, and YouTube celebrities who they're giving their own interpretation of the text. They're like, no, it doesn't mean that. It means, and, and do they have the authority to be giving their own interpretation? Do they understand the text 100% and all the commentary for the last 2,000 years written on that to be able to give their own interpretation? Right, well, you know, for this- me, I'm just giving the, the, the traditions interpretation and how it's worked for me and sometimes how it hasn't worked for me. Yeah, I think that's really important as well because when you, when you start really pouring into Parashra, there are certain sections, um, you know, and, and there, there's some debate among scholars nowadays as well um, that, you know, Parashra as it's presented today in the translations that are currently available to English, that these are regarded more as, as compilations of uh, quote unquote Parashra's greatest hits. So mm -hmm. you'll have certain elements that, um, you know, the, in the West particularly, we, we have delineated as being Jaimini versus Parashra, such as uh, Rashi Drishti, for example, um, you know, when we talk about Argala or even Bhava Padas, these are things that are primarily thought of as being Jaimini, although in, in this lineage, it's important to understand that since these are originating from Parashra's texts, there's no distinction between the two. And uh, when we actually are reading the texts, and a lot of people that break down um, Rashi Drishti as a Jaimini technique, and um, Graha Drishti as a Parashra technique, the, most of the time, the people who are, who are using those terms aren't people who are regularly studying the texts. Because when we regularly study the texts and we look at how they are interacting, we can see that there's, um, if I wanted to divide uh, two main traditions that exist in the West, we have the Varha Mahira tradition and the various texts that were built on top of it. And then we see the teachings of Parashara and Jaimini. And there's a coherence between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are using these Varaha Mahira, uh, Jataka, Parijata, Saravali, Faladipika techniques, and they're calling that Parashara. And then they look at the Brahat Parashara Hora Shastra, and they're like, oh, those things were added. And it's like, how can you say those were added? You know, you have a textual system that's a, a coherent system coming from Varaha Mahira. And then we look at uh, Rahat Parashahora Shastra and Jaimini, and we see a coherent system there. And if we look at a text like um, Prashnamarga from the 16th century, we can see that in his text, he's beginning to integrate the two systems. He's, right. he's a great, um, he has great devotion to Varaha Mahira, but he's using techniques that are not Varaha Mahira, that are much more from these other texts. So we can, if, you, if a textual study gives us a bifurcation that doesn't match the general discussion that's happening um, by some people. And to me, it's not a matter of discussion. We go to the text, we look at what the texts have and what they don't have. And, and we, we proceed uh, according to the textual tradition. Right. So this is actually a really good segue into mm -hmm. the next section, which I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Science of Life course, particularly, um, you know, as of the date of recording this, which is um, uh, January 12th, 2020, um, you're going to be starting up another uh, batch of, um, of level one yes. uh, in late February. And I'll be posting some 
links in the description, including the links that you mentioned earlier to your YouTube channels. Um, what can a student who, you know, who wants to learn Jyotish, um, what can they expect to learn from the level one course in a nutshell? In a nutshell. <laughs> um, so uh, my original goal with that text was to introduce astrology that was compatible with this tradition. So that when people would come to hear the teachings of uh, Pandit Sanjay Roth, they had, the, they had the majority of key concepts they needed to be able to follow along. When you know, I talked about how his teachings were received in Orissa, when he first started teaching in Delhi, uh, people were calling him a liar. People were saying he was making these things up. People didn't believe, you know, he was, people would say things and he'd be talking about Dasha systems and concepts that nobody had even heard about in, you know, they were in the text, but nobody knew how to use them and what they meant. So he's a, a real, um, he's transformed what Jyotish practice has looked like um, based on his teachings. And there's a saying that, um, uh, based on level of knowledge, if, if you know, like uh, a fifth grader, if you teach them nuclear physics, it's, you're, 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 it seems crazy. But if you teach them algebra, they can begin to understand. So there's these levels to get to. So science of light is almost a introduction into the tradition, an introduction into the teachings, grounding them in, in a textual source, grounding them how tradition interprets them, and making sure that the key elements are there. And then my course, um, so many courses are done where people just learn things and, and, and leave. One of my goals is to make the course very practical so that um, people are reading charts when they're done. Because if we learn certain techniques and we aren't applying them, they go in and they just go out somewhere. So the course is, is really geared to, to make a person a practicing astrologer using the fundamentals of the tradition. Right. And I, I can personally vouch for the fact that um, although I was doing chart readings beforehand, I, I really uh -huh. feel like uh, in doing this course, just because of the, the number of, of live sessions that we were having as a group and coming together and reading each other's charts, that my ability to look at charts just went up exponentially mm -hmm. um, taking this course. It's a lot more practical based, but that said, studying Jyotish is not necessarily um, simple. You know, you don't just sort of open it up and, you know, you know, memorize a couple of things and then expect to read. You kind of need to be able to connect the dots um, as it were. And, you know, and also there, there is a, a fair bit of effort that needs to go into opening these books and looking yes. at the Shastra and comparing back and forth. So, and, and I think, you know, we, when we, when we started off there, there was a, a, a large group and, you know, it slowly whittled down to some of the mm. more serious students over the course yes. of, of the year. Um, if I were to ask you what would uh, be the key things that you would be looking for in a student that would make them successful in studying astrology. Um, what would that be? <laughs> Commitment. Um, you know, doing my course, people have to plan five to 10 hours a week of study. Um, we have the textual material to read. We have the videos to watch. Then we meet together and work on charts and apply the principles. And then there's further study that comes from that. And so that's happening each week. So um, a lot of times people aren't ready for this level of, of study. Uh, but when people are done, uh, you, as you yourself have gone through it, there's a certain level of confidence of like, okay, I got this, I know how to do this. And if there's something I don't know, I know where to go to find it. I know where to get references. I, and, and afterwards, people that graduate, we have the graduates group. So there's this place where people are really supported. Um, so, so serious, you know, somebody who's, who's ready to make the commitment to, to learn 
uh, in an authentic way, in a traditional way, and uh, somebody who has a strong desire to be practicing astrology, That's to be wonderful. able to read a chart proficiently. That's wonderful. Um, the other, the other thing that sort of ties into this, because yes. this, as you mentioned, this is a practical course and this lineage. And I mean, I can't necessarily sp speak to other lineages because I mm. haven't necessarily been a part of them, but um, you know, when you look at from a foundational perspective and even from uh, when we start talking about remedies and that kind of thing, um, it's very heavily focused on Sanskrit and it's primarily focused on mantras as well. And um, I was just wondering if I could get some of your, mm -hmm. your thoughts on, on why um, is like mantra integrally linked yeah. to this tradition and, uh, you know, into the textual, you know, into Parashra as well and, and that relationship. And so when we start talking about the mantra, that's where Achyutananda becomes so important. Um, uh, and one of the main teachings of Achyutananda is how powerful sound is. And uh, in the Vedic tradition, the understanding is, is that we think in with uh, words. We, there's a thought process. And that thought process is, an, is a quality of sound. And so as sound happens, as word happens, as we speak, the more words we know, it alters the way we perceive reality. It alters our way of interacting with reality. And so sound is fundamental to the uh, relation of consciousness of the experiencer to what is being experienced. And so mantra becomes crucial because it's this um, methodology of altering consciousness, of working with consciousness, of, of being able to put consciousness in different places. We want to study, we need a mantra that can help our mind focus. Um, we, if we're suffering, we need a mantra that's working with a certain quality of what we're suffering with that can help us come to the place where we can get over that suffering. So the tradition uh, is very heavily rooted in mantra and this is, uh, this is where the uh, Achyutananda tradition um, really shows its face. Wonderful. Yes. And, and yeah, there are, we, we did, um, I can personally attest to the fact that we did do a lot of practice of mantra, you know, throughout the, the, throughout the course and even, um, um, you know, through the actual lectures you present, uh, mm -hmm. the form of Nyasa that, um, that we can do as well, which is basically taking the, uh, the bijas of the Sanskrit alphabet and placing them within parts of our body and energizing our body and getting ready for even more mantra practice. So, so level one, we're really working with the Sanskrit alphabet. That way when we get to level two and we're doing mantras, we, we have the alphabet that those mantras live within. Right. That's wonderful. And then, so lastly, I guess if I'm a student, I'm a prospective yes. student, I'm interested in finding out more about the course and I want to connect with you. Um, how do I go about doing that, Freedom? Uh, so um, there's a few different ways. Uh, if somebody's ready to sign up, there's the scienceoflight.net uh, website. And that has more information. People can sign up and... and uh, uh, level one, we actually send a student version uh, book um, uh, for people who have questions. Uh, on the, there's various Facebook advertisements. And uh, because there's been so many people that have gone through the course that are practicing astrologers, they, um, they assist. And, and so when people have questions about the course, was it like this? Can I do this? Is this in it? Um, a lot of the past students will answer the questions and, and really um, uh, discuss uh, a lot of the more simple questions that people have. Um, people that are very serious but have you know, questions that are more difficult to answer, um, they can email and uh, set up a time to talk with me to make sure that the course is right for them. And uh, I always take time 
to just get to know each student a little bit and make sure it is the right course for them. Because somebody who's just interested in, in knowing what their chart means, it's not the right, you know, this is not the right course. Somebody that wants to be able to read charts, this is the course. So, right. and if we can differentiate that, then uh, we get successful students. That's fantastic. And just as a reminder, I will be posting those links in the video description. So people that are interested um, either for this batch or for future batches, they can, they can certainly look it up and get in touch with you. Uh, Freedom, you are such a wealth of knowledge and experience in the realm of Jyotish. And uh, I just want to personally thank you um, for, you know, for being my teacher and uh, mm -hmm. introducing me to the, uh, the world of uh, Jyotish Shastra as taught by Parashra. Um, but I also want to thank you for coming on to my channel today and, mm -hmm. and talking a little bit about this. And um, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. And if you have any questions, please leave uh, them in uh, the, please write them below and I'll, uh, I'll address them. And if I can uh, point you into the right direction to freedom, I'll be happy to and, do that. As and well. certain ones I'll try and address too in, in the comments. So. Okay, great. So thank you very much, Freedom. Yes. And thank everyone else. for having me. Thank you for watching and uh, stay tuned for more coming at you. Talk to you soon. And